it's not about getting back to an old version of yourself. Like this is your time to recreate yourself as an athlete. Once I kind of embrace the fact that I'm not getting back to something, if I'm racing and competing again and I'm not winning, fine. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running for Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who lived in Orange County, California for eight months, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me for episode 10 of the Running For Real podcast. And I want to start this episode off by saying thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate you subscribing, reviewing the podcast on iTunes, sharing it with your friends and in your Facebook groups. It really helps me so much. And I have climbed the ladder on the iTunes rankings, which is exactly what I wanted. Not quite in the top yet, but hopefully we will get there. And I'm sure I will if you guys keep supporting me the way you have been. So last week's powerful episode was with Heidi Greenwood and Nicola Rinaldi, and we were talking about amenorrhea. So if you've been following along with my story, you probably know quite a lot already. But even if you haven't, this is definitely going to be one worth listening to because it wasn't just about amenorrhea. Heidi was so brave in sharing her story. And if you didn't already get the tissues out, make sure you do, because it was just such an inspiration and you're going to really learn a lot. Today we have an interview with Amelia Boone. Now, Amelia is pretty well known in the obstacle racing world. Actually, she's probably the best man or woman obstacle racer there is. But actually, recently she's got more attention from the rest of the running world because of her her honesty, her bravery, and just kind of being true to who, who she is. By She shared her struggles about coming back from two major injuries and she's just really real with her fear of her comeback. And, you know, it's such a common thing, but no one really talks about it. So she was very true to this today. She was genuine. She was authentic and she was fun. I know you are going to love her. So that is enough from me. Let's meet Amelia. Welcome to the Running For Real podcast. Amelia Boone, I am so excited to have you on here. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. I'm um, stoked to be on. So, oh, this Thanks. is exciting for me, especially with I. Once I set this up with you, I bought a book and I thought, oh, I'm <laughs> going to start reading that book. You know what I'm coming, what I'm saying right now. <laughs> right. And I opened the first page, and there was your name on the book from <laughs> Tim Ferriss of all people. And I was like, what? Like that's when you know you've made the big time when you not only are in a book by Tim Ferriss, but you're on the first page. <laughs> So how did you manage that before? This wasn't on my questions list, but it just came to my mind. How did you get to be that good friends with Tim Ferriss? I'm so impressed. Well, so I was actually on his podcast. I was a guest of his uh, about a year and a half ago. And so that's why the the Tools of Titans is a book that, I mean, it's a fantastic Mm -hmm. book. And not just, I don't say that because I'm in it, but it just really distills profiles of all of his podcasts. He's interviewed some crazy high achievers. So I always joke, people are like, well, how did you get to be the first profile? And I say, well, he just wanted to get like the bad one out of the way first. So <laughs> no one would remember it, you know, and then you, you in strong, start weak and strong. So yeah. <laughs> or the other way that he was that impressed with you that he was like, no, this is the one everyone has to read because with that book, I'm sure most people are the same. Like you, you start thinking, okay, I'm going to read this from cover to cover. But then you mm-hmm. end up kind of bouncing around. But everyone's right. going to start with that first page. So, you know, kudos to you. That's that's probably your most impressive thing here uh, with get, getting to be <laughs> with you. that level Thank with Tim you. Ferriss. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite an honor. So. <laughs> but it's pretty cool. And I want to kind of talk as you have so many impressive results and kind of accolades to your name, including, I guess, the, the biggest one you're known for is the three times winner of the world's toughest mudder. Mm -hmm. 2012 2014 2015 and I'm sure it would have been 2016 had (laughs) there not been a little blip in the radar which we will talk about and then you're also a uh, full-time corporate attorney so Mm -hmm. the biggest question that I'm sure most people are wondering about with you know things like that to your name how the heck do you manage to fit it all in where do you find the time Well, little known fact, but I've secretly figured out how to make my days 30 hours. Uh, (laughs) No, I joke. Uh, I'm I'm not quite sure, to be uh, completely honest. I seem to have um, an ability 
to function pretty well on not a lot of sleep. And unfortunately, as we can probably get into later, I think that may have caught up to me for Mm -hmm. a number of reasons, but I generally, I am a very early riser, just very naturally. But so I get all my training in, you know, I wake up at 4am and I get my training in, in the morning beforehand. And so before I head into work for a full day, so I know that I can get the training in and it's not going to be interrupted. Whereas if I leave it till the end of the day, then Mm. it's, then it's more likely that I'll get stuck at work and things like that will come up. So it's not always a perfect fit. And I obviously make, you know, I make sacrifices in other areas of my life and I I don't, I don't have kids. Um, I can't imagine how that equation, my hats are off to people who manage full-time careers, kids and training, you know, it's one of those things. I'm like, I think you can juggle two balls pretty well, but you add that third and it it all falls over. Exactly. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. And um, so, just curious, as when you were saying that I'm also an early riser, you know, I always Mm -hmm. say to people that I feel like someone switches a a light on in my brain at like five in the morning, and it's like ding, and it's like Mm -hmm. time to time to start going. But then, do you not find with all the training that sometimes when you are at work, maybe you feel a little bit tired or like you know, training kind of catches up to you. How do you manage to stay like mentally on top of things? Then with that being the case, if you've, you know, let's say you've had a really hard workout in the morning, do you ever find it kind of is tough to juggle the um, concentration aspect of things during the day? Yeah, I find the one thing actually that I find is if I am super static for a while at work and then I'll find myself starting to, if I've had a tough workout, if my body is tired, I'll start to drag. Mm. But an instant fix for me is really, I work on the fifth floor. Like if I go and then take the elevator down to the bottom and then hike back up the five stairs Mm -hmm. or five flights of stairs, like instantly mental, Mm. mentally I'm with it again. Uh, so I just need just a little bit of movement and little spurts during the day. And that really keeps me, keeps me on top of it. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I can't, it's desk jobs are tough. I tell people that I I always thought that it would be a perfect compliment to running high mileage and super hard competitions. Cause I'm like, look, like I just sit all day at work. I'm resting and relaxing and recovering. And then I actually kind of realized that I probably do the worst possible combination mm-hmm. ever, mm-hmm. which is train really hard and then stay static really hard for the rest of the day. And so I've had to find ways like getting up, you know, walking on, thank God I drink a ton of liquid. So I have to pee every <laughs> 30 minutes. So I'm always heading to the bathroom. So it's finding that little movement to try and remove the static from my life. And it's not just people say, Oh, we'll get a standing desk. And I'm like, have a standing desk, but people always, you know, their, their posture slumps, things yeah. like that. It's not just about sitting versus standing. It's about like the little movements. So I'm so glad you brought that up as well, because I think so often we, and I was, I'm definitely guilty of it too. You, you get in this, it's easy to get in a mindset of being like, Oh, I've covered, you know, 20 miles today. So I've earned, you know, sitting around on my butt all day, but like you said, mm-hmm. it's not necessarily the the best thing for you. And, and it, like you said, it's two ends of the extreme. So I'm glad you mentioned that and, you know, gave a suggestion to make sure you do stay active. And, you know, I think I heard somewhere that, um, for every hour you sit, you should get up for at least a minute, but even a minute is enough. So, you know, right. that, I mean, you're obviously doing more than a minute if you're going up five flights of stairs, but still it's good to kind of keep moving around, even if you are tired from your training. And, and I'm glad to hear that. And I've just realized I didn't ask you your fun fact or hidden talent. So do you have something <laughs> to share with us? So this is actually an interesting fact that, and I actually think I'm the only person that can ever lay claim to this in in the world, is that I have appeared in both Playboy and Maxim fully clothed. Mm. And not only fully clothed, in a wetsuit. Uh, So Playboy uh, wrote this article on World's Toughest Mutter back in 2012. And people say, oh, I read Playboy for the articles. And I'm like, oh, it was actually a really great article. But they used a picture of me that I'm literally covered. It's from the race, covered in a wetsuit, head to toe. The only thing peeking out is my face. It's covered in mud. You can't even tell I'm a woman. And I think it's just, to me, I think it's absolutely hilarious <laughs> because I can tell people that I was in Playboy and people are like, really? And for me, I'm like, yeah, but you should really actually just see the picture because it's <laughs> so funny. It's so funny. Uh, to me, I find that hilarious. Yeah. Um, 
and very, very few. I don't think I've ever actually really talked about that, but I just thought about it. No, that, no, that's a great one. And do you yeah. have you ever mentioned that to someone and kind of watch their reaction when you say that without mentioning oh, the yeah. wetsuit thing? Just I'd I'd love to see the different reactions of people like, oh. <laughs> and most people, most people, I've done it. I've done it before in conversation, and people are like, oh, that's nice because nobody really knows how to. They can't yeah, yeah. tell if I'm. They can't tell if I'm proud of it. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm, you know, ashamed of it or what, or they're picturing like a, a spread, a center spread or something like Mm -hmm. that. And I'm like, no, 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 (laughs) nothing like that whatsoever. (laughs) They decided to write about this crazy race and I happened to win that race. And it was probably the most unflattering picture of me that's ever been in a magazine that happens to be in Playboy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess most people that are reading that magazine probably aren't thinking too much about the articles that are in it anyway so the people that are going to read the actual article are more interested in the words so exactly um (laughs) so then let's go on to talking about the obstacle racing you know you mentioned that was how Mm -hmm. you know you ended up in 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 playboy magazine and um amongst other things but like how how does a person discover that they're good at obstacle racing like how did that come about Yeah. So I think just, just like any other people getting into running people, things like that, you, you end up, it's a lot with a friend who just asks, Hey, have you seen this? Do you want to do this? And so for me, it was, it was a coworker. I was at a law. I was a first year associate at a law firm in Chicago and a group of us decided to go out and run this thing called tough mutter that had just launched. It was back in 2010. And we saw people running through electric wires and like, Oh, cool. Let's do that. And I mean, I was scared spitless. I had, I had no idea what I was facing. And I remember getting on the course and just absolutely loving it, but also realizing how bad I was at things Mm -hmm. like monkey bars. Like you don't think about, you think about it like, Oh, I did monkey bars all the time as a kid. And then you try and do them as adult and you're like, Oh my God, why is this so hard? And so for me, it was all of a sudden I realized I had been you know, it stayed active. I didn't play really. I played sports growing up, but I didn't do anything in college. I didn't do anything in law school. And I went to the gym just to stay in shape because that's what you do. And all of a sudden I found a purpose to work out. I found a purpose to train. And that to me was to get better at these things that I was awful at. And so to, to me, obstacle racing was just this kind of a challenge and a new goal. And it gave me some focus. And I spent six months trying to be able to do a pull up and things like that. So no, that that's good. And I think good for people to hear that it isn't, it wasn't just like you, you know, went to try one one day and you were like immediately at the front of the pack, like you had to kind of mm-hmm. work at it. And, and it's funny you mentioned pull-ups because that's literally what one of my goals is right now. <laughs> it's like, I am going to be able to do a single pull-up. Um, right. And yeah, like you, you would think it would be easy to kind of develop, right. but yeah, it's taken a while. So, and it's hard because I kind of backed into it differently okay. that, that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a runner or anything like that. I mean, I ran to like stay in shape, but I didn't want to run races. Mm-hmm. I didn't. And so I kind of through obstacle racing, I fell in love with running and I never expected that. And so that was different. A lot of people come from running background and start out and then transition. Mm-hmm. And I kind of did it the other way. So, which I guess maybe is because you kind of came at it from like a fun aspect. Whereas you mentioned like doing the monkey bars as a kid. And I think as, as kids, you know, we, we think about monkey bars as like play and how it was fun Mm -hmm. and stuff. And so you're going at it, you know, obstacle racing is fun. And then you're going back into that childlike mindset. Whereas I think a lot of us, when we think of running, we think of like being a teenager, being forced to do cross country training and in school and you know everyone's out there like puffing away with their red faces and (laughs) it's not a great experience for most so like it kind of puts that negative like connotation on running whereas you were coming at it from like oh this is fun like when I was a kid so yeah it's interesting really interesting and so one thing that uh, one of the members in the running for real superstars the community that I have they asked about or someone mentioned um that you say about recovering like a pro And you said, Mm -hmm. don't train like a pro if you can't recover like a pro. So this is something I Mm -hmm. wanted to kind of dive in a little deeper with. Um, What does that mean to you? And how can people listening kind of take that into action themselves? Yeah, that's actually something that came from my running coach, um, David Roach. And he and it makes a lot of it. It struck me and it makes a lot of sense to me. And I think 
it's tough. And it's the trap that I found myself getting into pre-injury. It's like my life is before and after injury, (laughs) Uh, but that I found myself getting into, you know, two, three years ago is that I was working out twice a day. I was running high mileage. I was creeping up towards a hundred miles a week, but then I was also working eight to 10 to 12 hour days. And I was neglecting all of the things that I, that, and this kind of harkens back to what we were talking about that I thought, you know, well, having a desk job is, is kind of like recovery because you're Mm -hmm. just sitting there all day, but not really. Like I wasn't paying attention to the sleep aspect. I wasn't paying attention to all the mobility and all of those little things to be doing that professional athletes, that's what they structure their days around, you know? So I think that it's been this process for me over these past few months coming back from injury to kind of realize the limitations that I have, that the stress from having an additional career outside of just running outside of just competing has to factor into that recovery as well. So I may need to run lower mileage. I may need to cut down on my volume just to, to balance all of that. And then to also incorporate, you know, make sure that I'm getting enough sleep and doing all those little things. And I think that that's a very real challenge to the vast majority of like the 95% of athletes out there that aren't doing this on a full-time basis. Mm -hmm. And so when you said about, you know, doing this, how have things changed? You have cut back on mileage. How, so you've made time for these recovery aspects through cutting out essentially some of the the running and the training itself? Or are you saying you've just kind of um, made it a priority within other areas, like you may, maybe when you get home in the evening or things like that? How have you changed it since? Yeah, well, I'm still working. I'm still rebuilding mileage right now. Um, it's been a very, very long and slow process. And that's been necessary because mm-hmm. uh, the first time I tried to come back from injury, I made the classic mistake of trying to come back too fast and then got injured immediately again. Uh, so I, right now I'm still at like a lower volume than I will be at. So it's, I, it's something that is easier to juggle, but I'm definitely, what I'm realizing is actually saying no to a lot of extraneous things that would take up more time and take away from sleep and take away from, you know, the, the, the foam rolling in the evening or, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's, that may be that, look, I, I can't travel across country to do a photo shoot for a few hours because I need to stay here and focus on my recovery, my rehab or things like that. So, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just making that a priority. And would you suggest based on what you've learned and stuff, you know, would you suggest other people in this situation who, you know, maybe are training for like a big race that's coming in Mm -hmm. a few months, like, have you noticed a difference in the, the way that you feel? I know you said your mileage isn't quite up there yet to know Mm -hmm. fully, but just for now, like, have you, would you say it's worth it for anyone listening to make the time for that and kind of to learn to say no, like you said, just for a few months? I think I definitely, I think it is. And I think definitely more and more, um, I've been focusing on the importance of rest Mm. and, uh, complete rest days before I got injured. I actually, I always was like, I don't do rest days. I take active recovery days, (laughs) you know, and, 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 but really the active recovery days would then just turn into another workout. Mm -hmm. And so I really think that that's important for a lot of people to, and it's hard for a lot of runners to, to take a step back. Um, but I, like I do one full complete rest day a week. Um, and then actually as I'm rebuilding mileage, I've been doing two. Okay. So, and I've been feeling much better mm-hmm. <laughs> having, having rest. And the thing that nobody talks about, and I didn't realize this actually either is that I always said, I don't respond well to rest days because the next day when I would go out and run, I would feel awful. Mm -hmm. So I would think, okay, well, rest days aren't working for me. And then I realized that that's just physiological, like physiologically what happens. Like you're supposed to feel bad Mm -hmm. on your run. That's what you do an easy run the day after your rest day, because like your body's coming back from, I didn't never understood that. 
And so, so I just gave up rest days because I thought I didn't respond to them. But now I'm realizing kind of the pattern of how that works. Yeah, I think that's an important point for anyone listening. If you are taking rest days, like Amelia said, uh, you you never really want to put you know a race or a hard workout the day after a um, a rest day, and that's why mm-hmm. actually we re- you know most people recommend running the day before your big race, even if it is you know only a mile or two, because your body is going to respond to that better than a complete rest day. So I'm glad you mentioned that as well. So then let's, let's talk about this, this injury stretch that you went through. So maybe tell Uh us about that time, you know, what happened and how that kind of came together for you and how it affected you mentally. Yeah. So I was at the end of the end of 2000. Well, I'm trying to think what year it was 2015. I just finished, you know, I had one world toughest matter for the third time. I had just moved out to California and I was really looking for like, I loved obstacle racing, but I realized I love just long distance running. And so I turned my eye kind of towards ultra running and I was fortunate enough. I went out, I ran down, ran a hundred K and got a golden ticket to run Western States uh, for in 2016 increased mileage, was doing all that kind of stuff. And just, I mean, really I just overuse biomechanically. I ran myself into a stress fracture in my femur and, uh, it ended up being much larger than we expected. (laughs) And, uh, so I was on crutches for about three and a half, four months. And that was in, uh, a ride around was the end of April last year. So just about a year ago, And I realized at that moment that everything I'd been working for all the training, I I wasn't going to be able to run Western States. And if anyone, you know, is listening, knows Western States is like the Super Bowl of ultras that Mm -hmm. you don't necessarily ever get a chance to run it again. It's not like you can defer your entrance injury to the next year. And so things just kind of came crashing that came crashing down. My, my rate, my obstacle racing season was kind of blown um, out the door. But I think I kind of, I told myself, I'm like, okay, Emily, it's just three, four months, just, just, you know, white knuckle it. You'll be back. You'll, you'll come back for the end of our obstacle racing championship season is kind of end of September, October, November. I was like, you'll be back. It'll be no problem, et cetera. And then, so in August of last year, I, I came off the crutches, the femur was healed and, uh, got back into training and I thought, okay, I had two, I have eight months or eight weeks to prepare for Spartan race world championships, eight weeks. And I was like, and I can do it. You know, I maintain my fitness through aqua jogging, through, uh, ski erging, through lots of upper body stuff. So I was like, I can do it. And, um, made the classic mistakes that, (laughs) um, a lot of people do who are super eager, even though I told myself I wasn't doing it. I just went out of the gate running too much, too fast. And, had no idea how you actually reintroduce impact because I'd never been away from running that long Mm -hmm. and ended up with a sacral stress fracture about four weeks after I came off of crutches for the femur. And for anyone who's ever had like a string of two injuries, I mean, the femur was tough, but that second injury just I mean, it just gutted me Mm -hmm. because you feel there's no one to blame, but yourself. Mm -hmm. And I sat there being like, I was, I, I blew my chance and I told myself I wasn't going to do this. And I am like the stereotypical person that just, you know, like I made this mistake and I was ashamed of it. And I actually just didn't tell people, I just told people I had a setback in my, in my recovery and that I wasn't going to be able to come back. And so all of a sudden I went from, you know, a few months with the femur to then an entire year because Mm -hmm. the, the state girl stress fracture would take another 12 weeks. And you can't do any cross training during that time. Is that right? No. Well, so yeah, I mean the, the state, the the issue, and I didn't realize this with the sacrum is that, I mean, everything is connected to your back and to your, (laughs) to your sacrum, any movement. And so everything hurts, sitting hurt, standing hurt, walking hurt, laying down hurt. I remember my orthopedist being like, oh, the sacrum is nothing compared to the femur. And, but I was in so much more pain with the sacrum and I hit it the entire time from people. And I didn't tell people what was going on. Cause I was afraid of actually the backlash and the stigma that comes with stress fractures and especially in females. Mm-hmm. And so, and so for me, it was just, it was, it was really, really, really tough mentally, um, to deal with that. And 
honestly, so that I was cleared to run again in December of this past year. So December, 2016. And then I, you know, having been off of running for like nine months, uh, the rebuilding process and I'm, you know, we're in May now. Um, so five months later, it's, it's just, it's not a pretty road back. Mm -hmm. And I'm finally to a point, God, knock on wood where I'm running consistently and feeling good and building mileage, but mentally coming back has been way harder because every ache and pain, you are so fearful that it's, oh my God, it's again, I'm broken again. And your mind just jumps to that. So, so what did you do in, you know, those moments where, you know, runners, we tend to obsess over injuries, you know, when you have it, you're thinking about every step, every second of the day. And, and as you mentioned, especially with the sacral, it, you know, you said it hurt all the time. So that's even more reminder for you. So how did you kind of learn to push that out of your mind, not just while the injury was going on, but also, you know, as you were coming back from this injury, how did you kind of mm-hmm. keep it, keep yourself balanced, I guess, so you didn't kind of spiral out of control negatively? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's been a, uh, it's been a lesson in, in trying to, in trying to make peace with my body again and learning to trust it. And you really, the only way to do that is through practice. And it's funny. I mean, people have always, I was given the nickname a while ago, the queen of pain. And I found it ironic that the the queen of pain, who's put herself through multi-day races through every type of, of things imaginable has became so fearful of Mm. every little niggle of every little ache. And so what I've really realized is that I can only really do what's in the moment and just, I really have been really just trying to talk to my body and talk it through things. And you'll have those times. And I've had those times where I was positive. I had, you know, another stress fracture, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, and that this was happening all over again. And I'm like, okay, you can't do anything. Just wait, you know, take another day off, take two days off. And it's been soft tissue. No, it's just been, or it's been nothing. And so slowly it's been a process, but slowly I've learned to retrust. And I'm Mm -hmm. still learning that, you know, Mm -hmm. um, to not, to not be fearful of it, but to really, um, that it's, it's not going to go away overnight. The mental part isn't going to go away overnight. No, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I think a lot of people are going to resonate with that because, you know, injuries are a part of running and, and they do happen. And, um, you know, hearing you say that as someone that so many people look up to, I think it's going to help. And and I have to say, having not run in all this time now, I actually am really enjoying not having that paranoia of every time you feel like anything in your hip, you're like, is that a stress fracture? Like literally it was all the time. And now it's like kind of nice to be like, well, if I have a stress fracture in my hip, it doesn't matter. um, Yeah. And, and I always tell people too, and, and, and this was the main thing that I realized too, with injury and being out for as long as I was, is that the first few weeks were definitely the worst, mm -hmm. like the, the not being able to run, like just that grief and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But after a while, I almost forgot what it felt like to run. And I almost forgot And it just, it got so much easier. So anyone who's going through a long-term injury, I promise you it gets easier and like, you'll have ups and downs, but once you kind of can get to that state of acceptance, like it's really, it's a really, really valuable process. Yeah. And I'm so glad, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And, and I, you know, I don't know what you would add to this as well, but I would say to, you know, speak to people, find a, find a group, find some people, Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, will understand, you know, a lot of non-runners or people who aren't really particularly active are going to have a hard time being like, why are you so upset about running? But mm-hmm. find a group, you know, that's what I created that running for real community for, for people to have um, someone to, you know, other people to understand, but maybe find other people around you, you know, family, friends, or someone who gets it that you can kind of give this grief. Cause as you hear Amelia is saying that, you know, everyone goes through this where it is like essentially the five stages of grief. And when you get to acceptance, you can begin to move on with it, but don't feel ashamed that you are going through this. Is there anything you'd add with that? No, I, I, I definitely agree with that. And, and I think that everyone tells you, I, I mean, I, I, I created this list of like the top 10 things not to say to an injured runner. <laughs> I never got around to like publishing it, but cause I heard them over and over again. It's always like, you'll come back stronger and stuff like that. Uh, or the find other hobbies one, which was always it. And I, and I wrote a blog about this and I was like, no, 
no, I'm not going to like give up my identity as a runner just because I'm sidelined. And I think that's great. Like, yeah, find other outlets, fill your time, things like that, but don't feel like you have to give up Mm -hmm. something that you love. If you, you know, stay for me, even though it was really, really hard to do, I still went to all the races that I was supposed to be running. in. I went to Western States. I went to every single Spartan race that I was supposed to be out there on the starting line for and staying involved in the community was actually like my lifeline for me. So you would suggest that to people to go to watch Mm -hmm. the races that they are going to, that they would be missing to kind of see the, you know, the accomplishment of other people or what was your reasoning for doing that? Yeah, I think it's, it's very easy to hide your head in the sand and try and pretend that and to detach from the community and pretend that it isn't going on. A lot of people do that. And a lot of people are successful in that. And that's kind of the easy route, but I've never really been one to take that route. And I find that it's going to be really tough. I remember leaving those races and just crying because I wish that Mm -hmm. I could be out there, but I found other ways to enjoy the sport, which was through volunteering, which was through just meeting people and talking to people and sharing their stories. And when, when I would go out to Spartan races, for instance, in the past, and I would be towing the start line and, you know, the, the elite wave would go off and we would be done in an hour and a half. And then we would all hang out with each other. And then we wanted, you know, like we, you didn't really engage or talk to anyone else and you were you were done and gone. Mm-hmm. But what I realized by just hanging around the venue this past year, like being on crutches, that there were people in later waves of the day, you know, your, your age groupers and things like that, they're out there fighting tooth and nail, like mm. all day long and experiencing the race through them and their stories. Yeah. And it really gave me an opportunity and a different kind of appreciation for the sport. And mm-hmm. I mean, that's the same if you're a road racer or things like that. I mean, it's, it's the, you know, it's, it's all different, it, all different communities. So. Absolutely. And I've heard a lot about, um, volunteering as well, maybe picking a mm-hmm. race to volunteer at. So you kind of get to see the other side of it, which I could definitely see cause you're still around it and you get to see it. But, um, mm-hmm. like you said, you get to see the, the other people that are out there that you don't really notice when you are focused on you and your you and yourself only. So, right. um, so I wanted to ask you, as you were mentioning about don't quit kind of thing, did you ever think about quitting during this time? Like, was there during, any part? during the injury? Yeah. Or? Was there ever a point maybe after the second one where you're like, I can't take this anymore. Or was, was that never even in your mind? There were points where it was just, I think I, there were points of despair where I was so worried that was I ever going to get back to racing? And the thought was never in my mind to leave it. No. I mean, I just, it was, it's still something like a fire that still burned in me, but I kept talking. I was talking to my friends about like, when I can't, I just don't know if I'm ever going to get back. I mean, when am I going to get back? And, and then with that comes that fear of like, will I be the same athlete, you Mm -hmm. know, when I do get back to racing? And will I be able to be a world champion again? Will I be able to compete at that level? Or even if it's not just, you know, podiums, anyone who's, you always were, will I be able to run that time? Well, and you just don't know, especially because you've been out of it for so long. So, you know, I, with the help of my friend, Caroline Burkle, who I talked to on a daily basis. And she was like, Amelia, like, it's not about getting back to an old version of yourself. Like this is your time to recreate yourself as an athlete. Mm -hmm. Once I kind of embrace the fact that I'm not getting back to something that I'm moving forward, you know, whatever lies ahead of me. And if I'm, if I'm racing and competing again and I'm not winning fine, it doesn't matter. Like, I mean, sure. Part of my ego would be a, Sure. It would obviously, you know, you, you always want to do well, but at the same time for me, it's also just the gratitude to be able to physically be out there again. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I there wanted were to points talk about definitely where I question, where there were points where I questioned it, but I never really have wanted to give it up. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And yeah, I want to, I want to dive deeper into this because this is something that has been, you know, got a lot of attention lately is that blog post mm-hmm. you wrote about fearing yeah. return. And I don't know if Matt mentioned this to you, uh, Matt Davis, who is a mutual friend of ours. Um, yeah. when I first reached out to him to ca- ask him about, um, interviewing you, I said, Oh, you know, do you know Amelia? Cause I noticed that you were both in the, the, um, documentary rise of the suffer Fest. Yeah. And he said, did you see Amelia's blog post this morning? And I said, <laughs> no. 
And he was like, <laughs> oh, I thought it was just a bit of a weird coincidence. But yeah, so you'd right. released this blog post about pretty much what you were just talking about, which was about your yeah. fear of your return and, you know, that people would keep saying about comeback and you want to avoid that word. So maybe tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that, because I'm sure almost every runner can relate to this in some way that, you know, like you were talking about a minute ago, we just want to get back to where we were. And how, what would you say to people who fall into that trap of saying, oh, I just want to get back? Yeah, I guess for me, I had to kind of break down why I wanted to go back, you know, because why you wanted to idealize a a previous version of yourself and realize that, you know, things change. We age, we have injuries, our bodies change. And it's funny because as much as those accomplishes in the past, in the past, you look back on them, you, they make you happy and things like that. Like, to return, try and return to some previous version of yourself. If you think about it, it's just kind of ludicrous. Mm. So I give myself permission to morph into, you know, a new kind of athlete and that, and to accept, and it's hard for me still, I'm I'm not going to pretend that I have it figured out, but to accept that, look, I may not be able to run the hundred mile weeks that I, in my ideal world would love to run, uh, because there's nothing more that I love than being out on the trails for hours a day, Mm -hmm. but maybe that's just not going to be in the cards for me, given, you know, given the full-time job, given my history of injury, but to realize that that doesn't mean that I'm a failure. And that doesn't mean that moving forward, I can't be a a different version of myself or perhaps even a better version of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, we all have to like train and adapt through these things. And, you know, I wish I could say that I, that I have completely clear guidance on, you know, how to accept with that, but it's just, you know, it's where I'm at and it's a daily process for me. Um, just to be able to really, I think what's key for me now is celebrating like the little victories. You know, I went out actually, I ran a half marathon the other weekend and it was the longest that I've run since, you know, since in over a year. And for me a year ago, I would, I would have been ashamed that I only ran 13.1 miles because that's like an easy day. Mm -hmm. But here I was like, you know what? I'm super proud of this. And I'm going to own that, that I am proud of that. Yeah, no, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. And and it sounds like you've got the perspective right, right. And hopefully others listening will kind of be able to spin this into their own perspective. And would you say, knowing that a lot of eyes were on you before you decided that you needed to stop focusing on the past and trying to be that former version of yourself. Would you say that the mm-hmm. eyes on you, the expectation that you thought was on you from others, when in reality we know that it's not actually others, it's our own manifestation of others in our <laughs> head, but did that kind of play into anything that you were thinking, oh, everyone's going to you know, think I'm a yeah. failure or everyone's going to judge me? Oh, 110%. I think that it's funny that we start to think about what other people expect of us. Mm -hmm. And we start to say, you know, like, oh, but people are going to be disappointed if I don't return to the top of the podium or things like that. People don't care. (laughs) I mean, at the end of the day, we're so focused on ourselves. Like people are actually very like, no, but they may be like, oh, that's weird. She didn't win that race or whatnot. But then they'll move on and be wrapped up in their own lives. What it really is, it's an expectation on ourselves and especially any competitive or just any, you know, any runners are just generally very driven people that are very focused and competitive with themselves. So you have to realize that it's really an internal pressure and that Mm -hmm. people externally, they don't, you know, the people that love and care about you don't care about your marathon time, you know, <laughs> like <Yes. laughs> this not makes it does not what, like, it doesn't make you who you are. Yes. So exactly. And that, I, I couldn't agree with, more with you. That's exactly my stance on things. And I had a similar thing when I was um, getting ready to come out with this thing about um, yeah. amenorrhea and that I was going to stop running. And, you know, in, in initially I was like, oh, everyone's going to be like, oh, she, look at her. She let herself go. Look at that girl. <laughs> She's like, yeah. and, but in reality, like you said, no one, no one really cares that much. And so related to that, you know, you brought yeah. this out as a blog post, you kind of put the word out there. You said the things that everyone thinks, but no one talks about. And we've covered quite a lot of these things so far in this interview, but why did uh-huh. you feel like, I, I don't know if it was, that it was your obligation, but why did you feel like confident enough to be able to kind of say like, Hey, 
you know, this is what I'm scared of, you know, be vulnerable and kind of tell tell people like it is rather than hiding behind closed doors. Like you said, initially, you didn't say anything because you were kind of afraid. What gave you the confidence to speak out and be vulnerable? I've actually realized this past year is that the more vulnerable I am, the more confident I become. Mm -hmm. So putting yourself out there and I've never been one to hide things. Like Mm -hmm. I want, I appreciate when other people are open books because I find it very relatable. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny to me is that everyone, you think everyone loves and adores you when you're winning races and things like that. But people actually find it more refreshing when you're honest and real that you struggle because we all struggle. We all have our things. And so for me, it was getting in touch with just being authentic. And I know, and I'd read a ton of books about, you know, the sports, sports psychology and the mental game and, you know, having that confidence and bravado, even if you don't believe it. And I'm like, screw it. No, I don't have that confidence. And I'm going to admit that, you know, I'm just going to admit out there that I don't know. And it, it eats me up inside, but I'm, I hope that I'm, I don't think I'm alone. And I was actually really surprised at the response to it mm-hmm. that, cause I was afraid people were going to be like, Oh, whoa, is she, she's afraid stop she's whining. not going to like stop whining. Yes. She's not going to, she's afraid she's not going to win another world champion. <laughs> like boo. Hoo. Yes, yes, yes. But I realized <laughs> that it, people relate, it doesn't matter if you're on a, And I said, as I said to somebody, I said, a podium does not validate your feelings, you know? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if you are somebody that was training to run a four hour marathon or a two and a half hour marathon. Everyone is going to have their own benchmarks of what is good enough for Mm -hmm. them or what they want as their performance. And, you know, we all have those fears and self doubts in regardless of the level. And so I think that just admitting that and, and, and for me, it was like, okay, I put myself out there and expose this and it's refreshing to know that other people feel that way too. And I'm sure that you can relate to that too, with, Mm -hmm. you know, finally speaking out about a Maria and all the others, these other women are like, yes, Mm -hmm. me too. Like Mm -hmm. I struggle as well. And this is not, this is not one of those things that should be swept out under the rug and just be told like, that's normal. You're a runner. You don't have a period, you know? So. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And, um, and yeah, exactly, exactly the same. A lot of what you've said, I've, I've definitely been nodding along to and agree. And, and have you found since that point, since that affirmation from people that, you know, you've done the right thing and you're helping them, has it given you more confidence to keep doing it and kind of share, you know, Mm -hmm. especially in this comeback journey where, like you said, there's a lot of ups and downs, you know, have you been kind of saying like, this was a really bad day or, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. like what comes to mind for me when you're coming back from injury is you kind of have this image in your mind of when you're going to start running again and it will be amazing and everything's going to feel great and you're going to be so happy. But when you kind of start to think about how it is actually very difficult, uh, physically as well as mentally coming back, you know, you do go through a lot of downs just in, you know, am I ever going to run well again? Or like you said, am I ever Mm going to race again? So have you been able to share more of that now since that blog post? Yeah, I've definitely, I've, I've really kind of made it my goal to be very authentic, um, and just open about those things because, you know, social media is, is, is tough because we see these idealized fragments of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And especially with runners, you see people posting their mileage on a daily basis and, you know, the Strava game and people Mm -hmm. get caught up in all of that, but you never really, people don't talk about their downs and people don't talk about, the hard times. And it was kind of like when I got behind this movement and started this, this whole, uh, you know, (laughs) rest day brags and things like that is that (laughs) it was like, look, let's celebrate the things that people don't talk about and realize like, Hey, look, we all take rest days or Hey, look, we all have a bad run and just being vulnerable. And that's really been, it's been actually, it's been very therapeutic for me. I always tell people, I don't blog to necessarily help other people. It's more of a therapeutic, uh, like exercise for myself. Mm -hmm. It just happens to then help other people. And Mm -hmm. if it does, that's great. If it doesn't, you know, take what you want and leave the rest. But (laughs) yeah. No, I feel exactly the same way. That's what I say to people when I write my blog posts, it's literally 
just my mind dumping of everything that's in there. And then I just right. publish and whatever. <laughs> if right. you don't want to read it, exactly. don't read it. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. I'm glad you mentioned that. So then one more thing that I think people will be very interested in with you when it comes to obstacle racing, you know, as you yeah. mentioned, you've been given the the name like the queen of pain so um or the king of pain was it I can't remember what you said exactly queen Queen it was I wouldn't I thought for a minute there did I say that right but obviously when when it comes to that obstacle racing is going to put you in a lot of pain you know it takes a lot of mental strength so I'd love for you to maybe share a few things that people listening can kind of take into action themselves maybe in an obstacle race maybe in something else of how to kind of fight through that pain when when you're struggling Yeah, I tell people, and I think that this is applicable, you know, obstacle racing, or honestly, for me, the most pain is something like probably running a 5k, because then I have to Mm -hmm. run really, really fast, you know, so (laughs) people have different definitions of pain. But when you're in a really, really tough spot, I always really I think the best thing for me is to compartmentalize and to break things up. And it's like, you know what, I'm just I'm just going to get this is a 24 hour race. If I think about all 24 hours ahead of me, I'm going to quit instantly because you get involved in the big picture and you think I'm never going to be able to do that. I'm never going to be able to cover all those miles. If you think I'm just going to get to this next obstacle, or I'm just going to run that next mile. Um, you spot something that had to just get to that and think only on the here and mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. it becomes so much easier to like break that up and have that be manageable. And when things start to hurt and I do this, I mean, on a daily basis when I'm running, I'm like, Oh, all right. My uh, right hip kind of hurts right now. And I'm just going to focus on it and talk to it and, you know, work with it. And then it's nine times out of 10 in the next three minutes, it passes and then something else kind of hurts, you know? And then, so it's just kind of this awareness that I practice in the training to kind of be very cognizant of my body and realize that like, you're going to, things are going to ebb and flow in races and there are going to be pains and niggles that come and go, but you know, to, to just kind of work, to talk to it in the here and now and to work through it. So So when you say talk to it, do you literally mean like, you're like, it's okay, you know, glute, you're all right. Or like how, I just, I'm just curious because I talk (laughs) to myself like that in races, like you're fine, you're doing great. But like, are you literally talking about like you talk to that particular area or just your body in general? I actually do. I guess no, no, no. If it, it works, and I'm mean, sure people will try. I'd be like, you know what? It's fine. It's just going to work itself through. Like, okay, I hear you hollering at me. Um, and and what can I do? And the main thing is like, what can I do if anything to fix this in the here and now? Okay. So for me, if it's if it's a 24 hour race and I realize that a pain is starting to flare up, okay, if I take a walk break for a few minutes, is that going to help? You know, and so it was like, what can I do in the here and now to fix this um, and, you know, to 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 help me through it? Okay. Uh, so I think that that being very proactive in those instances, obviously, if it's you're running a very super short race, it's not always going to work that well. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. and do you, you know, start doing that like as soon as you feel anything or do you kind of say like, oh, you know, I'll check on that in a few minutes if it doesn't go away? Or is it like as soon as something flares up, you're like, OK, like time to talk to it now? Uh, I give it a few minutes. I generally do because we all have things that kind of rotate and come and go and, and, and things along those. So you don't want to, you know, overreact at any given point. But I always think that if something has been there for more than like five, 10 minutes, then maybe it's time to start thinking about what to do. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Nope. That's helpful. And then just one more question about that. What yeah. would you say your for you as being as successful as you are, I'm just curious, what would you say your biggest strength is, um, as an obstacle racer? Like what, what sets you apart? It's interesting. I think how I've succeeded and done very well is that I've never, I've always been kind of been a jack of all trades kind of athlete is that I've never been, I'm, I'm really slow. Like I can't, my mile time is, is horrendous. My sprinting ability. I was always dead last in the hundred meter dash when we were kids, uh, that you would do in gym class. Mm -hmm. Um, like, and I've never, so I've never been like a superstar in ever any like one particular thing, but I've always had this ability to just endure and just to keep going. When, when I was little, um, we'd play four soccer games in a day. I was the only kid in the fourth soccer game that still was like, Ooh, let's Mm -hmm. keep doing this. 
and so I've kind of, I think being very well-rounded and being strong and having endurance, but not necessarily being the best at anything suits itself really well to obstacle racing because you need, I tell people you have to be strong. You have to have endurance. You have to have some speed. And so it's kind of just this all around general physical ability. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just been very well suited to my strengths. Mm -hmm. No, that makes perfect sense. And, uh, and I could definitely see that being the case with you and through everything I've seen of you and then just, you know, with what would make sense. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then, so I've already mentioned our mutual friend, Matt Davis. Um, yeah. the, and then there's a great documentary, which Matt mentioned when I interviewed him on um, my previous podcast, but the documentary rise of the suffer Fest, which I would recommend mm -hmm. uh, anyone listening to check it out. I will put a link in the show notes, which will be at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 10 and uh, it kind of showed about how big obstacle racing is becoming and I just mm -hmm. was curious with you as you're so you know in this world where do you see obstacle racing going in the future yeah it's it's interesting we're in a we're in a very kind of pivotal time I mm -hmm. think because it's been around I mean it's only been around for about seven years at this point, um, really in full form, you could argue that mm -hmm. in the documentary will show that it does technically go back much yeah. further, yeah. but it's one of those areas where I think there's a different people are pulling in different directions that they, they want to see it in the Olympics, but if it wants to be in the Olympics, then it needs to be more standardized. And a lot of the things that drew me to obstacle racing, kind of the unknowns mm. and the non-standardization would have to go away because you kind of have to homogenize it. You kind of have to sterilize it to make it fit standards. So I think it's in this push pull right now where people are kind of dragging it in different directions. Mm. So I don't know, but I also see right now you see a lot of people, it's going to start specializing. I think you're seeing super shorter courses, especially mm. with popularity of American Ninja Warrior. You're seeing people really get invested in just a, you know, a, a, a one mile race that's super obstacle dense. But then you also have people that really just want to focus on like the, the really long stuff, like the world's toughest mud or the 24 hour stuff that I do. So we'll start to see some specialization. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily think there needs to be one version that comes out of it. I hope it all kind of, you know, that it keeps morphing, um, into, into different things. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's kind of a, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what unfolds. Yeah, absolutely. And, and kind of seems like it's headed in the direction of kind of just like road racing in general, that there mm -hmm. is kind of across the board, all the different aspects of it and different types and different distances, different terrains, all kinds of things. So it is going to be right. cool to see where it goes. And what would you like to say to anyone who is listening, who's thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'm too injury prone for an obstacle race or maybe, you know, it's a bit too scary. What would you say? Yeah. So I've, it's just funny. I've actually never been injured during the race. I, well, I take that back once I fell off an obstacle and like twisted my ankle, but I was fine within a few days. So you're never, it's funny. Adrenaline will actually really carry you far in keeping yourself safe during that stuff. So I know a lot of road runners are scared about the whole injury aspect, but I'm telling you, you're more likely to injure yourself from overtraining than you mm -hmm. are in a race. Mm -hmm. And also really, I, I think so many people should give it a shot and, but you have to go into the expectation that you're going to be awful at it at first, because it's a new skill set. Mm -hmm. But and so you see a lot of runners go in and be like, I can crush this and blah, blah. blah. And then they get annihilated once they get to the obstacle because you've never done them before. Mm. And then they just walk away and they're like, no, I I'm done. I'm not good at this. But if you stick with it, it's a, it's a steep learning curve, but you get the hang of it really quickly. And so we see some really good runners come in that if they stick with it and do a few races and pick up the technique and the skills for those obstacles, then they're unstoppable. So, um, I think if you get through that learning curve, yeah. uh, it's, it's definitely worthwhile. So what would be the best way to kind of train for the obstacle aspect of things? I mean, is it strength training yeah. or is it practice literally finding obstacles around and practicing them? Or? Unfortunately, that's the thing with obstacle racing is more and more you see obstacle gyms popping up, but there's still very mm -hmm. few and far between. So it is all about kind of mimicking 
so I tell people grip strength is key. So yeah, if, I mean, if you do have a playground <laughs> and if you're not looked at oddly, uh, <laughs> uh, monkey bars are there. Um, but it's, it's things like you can, it's all about controlling your body weight. So that's where push ups, pull ups, it's the basics burpees, and you don't really need to be fancy. And a lot about obstacle racing and doing well in it is your heart rate will spike on an obstacle. And then it's about controlling that and bringing it down and using the run between obstacles as kind of mm-hmm. the recovery. Oh, okay. So in your training, I'll do things. You'll see people do like a burpee 5k. So you'll run a 5k, but every 400 yards, you'll stop and do five or 10 burpees to spike your heart rate, to mimic that. And then you go back to running. So it's about those transitions. Okay, cool. No, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We are going to yeah. go to the running for real four now. So yeah. I'm going to start with a uh, unique nutrition tip or something that you like <laughs> to eat. Maybe if you, whatever you'd like to say. Yeah. So I, I, I am very well known for eating pop tarts before races. So I don't really think <laughs> yeah. that that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's it unknown. So I'll, I'll just, I'll just leave that one aside. Uh, but I actually am a huge believer in beats and the power mm-hmm. of, and I know it's pretty common in the endurance world. Um, and full disclaimer, obviously I work with a, you know, a company that does, uh, powdered beet. Which one um, is it? Just some, a- uh, beet elite. Beet elite. Okay. Beet elite human. Um, to the power of, and, uh, makes this product called beat elite. But I'm, you know, if you are, if athletes are looking for edge in, you know, in pre-racing and stuff like that, I'm telling you how you, you'd have to drink gallons of beet juice to get the same effect as you mm. do from, you know, a concentrated supplement. Um, and it's funny, actually I gave, I, you know, used to take regular pre-workouts and things like that are loaded with all types of crap. And once I stopped taking those and switched to beets, it's funny, all my blood tests suddenly started to become way more normal. Um, (laughs) So that was an unintended side effect. So yeah, yeah. can't complain about that. So I will put a link in the show notes for Be Elite for anyone who is interested in giving it a try. And what about a running for real moment, a moment that was embarrassing or maybe scary or something that you'd like to share? So I was thinking about this and as I was rebuilding mileage coming back from injury, uh, my runs would be like, you know, one to two miles and they would be, it was no, I couldn't run any faster than a 10 minute pace and it needed to be on soft surface. And it was, you know, like one day on one day off. And so I have this very vivid memory of, it was the middle of winter and I was, (laughs) had to get on a flight uh, at like 5 a.m. So I woke up at 3 a.m. and did loops around this turf soccer field for my 1.5 miles that I was allowed to run. Mm -hmm. And I remember just being so happy just to be out there, just to like physically be running again. And you know, to anyone else, to a lot of competitive runners, that seems like, oh, you ran 1.5 miles, whoop de doo But, you know, realizing that that's in those moments, like that's where champions are made, you know, like having the discipline to be like, this isn't pretty, this isn't glamorous. This is awful. I'm running 10 miles a week, you know, but like these are the steps that I have to take mm-hmm. and really putting aside your ego. And to me, I realized like that's like the most real it gets, you know, that. that's putting in the paces there. I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing. And and that you yeah. explained that so vividly. I could like imagine being in that moment. So <laughs> thank you. Um, and then a high moment and why it meant so much to you. Yeah, I, you know, I think <laughs> this will also morph into a running for real moment. <laughs> but the the first time that I won World's Toughest Mutter in 2012 and, you know, I, I, ran 90 miles and I crossed that finish line. I had never run 90 miles in my life. I never run like 50 miles in my entire life. And just the enormity of it to me has been a feat that I've never, like, there's just this feeling like, Whoa, like I just did that. Mm -hmm. I just accomplished that. And being utterly dead. And, um, still to this day is like one of my favorite moments. And it's funny. I had to, I went straight from that. I just run for 24 hours hopped on a flight back to Chicago. I was a law firm at that point and then went straight to work and had to pull an all nighter. Mm. Um, and so, 
<laughs> it was like, it was this moment of this high of running, but then also the reality of, you know, the, the working f- full time and how that, yeah. it was like, the world doesn't stop because you just ran for 24 hours. Yeah. No, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I, uh, it goes down as one of my favorite, favorite memories. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I can only imagine how much of a hole you were in the week after both of those combined <laughs> together, but well worth right. it, I'm sure. And what do you tell yourself when you're standing on the start line? Yeah, I, when, when I'm on the start, star line is like the worst moment for me. I'm yeah. going to be completely honest. Some people love star lines. I hate them because mm-hmm. I just, it's the most bundle of nerves. It's everything like that. I tell myself to go out there and have fun. Yes. And anyone who knows me, I actually don't like it when people are like, good luck, Amelia, go crush it out there. Can't wait to see you win. All I want my friends and family who know me when the night before a race, all I want is a text that says, Amelia, have fun tomorrow. Yep. And, um, cause look, I put enough internal pressure on myself as I'm sure all of us do. So I tell myself to go out there, have fun and to smile. And, uh, that's what I tell myself. And that's in, in dark moments in races. That's what I tell myself. I go, Amelia, are you having fun right now? And that will instantly put a smile on my face. Oh, I love that. I, I literally tell myself the exact same thing and people always same thing kind of say, yeah, but don't you need to like pump yourself up or like I'll say to they'll be like any advice for my race and I'm like just have fun and they're like as if you tell yourself to have fun when you're going for a race and I'm like actually I do because exactly the same thing like you know if you say to yourself I just want to have fun I just want to cross the finish line smiling you know th- then everything else all, all the training will take care of the actual running the hard part but like right. yeah I, I love that and it keeps the pressure off yeah but see that's such good advice I love that yeah. Okay, well, is there anyone you want to give a shout out to, you know, who's been particularly uh, supportive or integral to your career before we before we end up here? Oh my goodness, I would have to yeah. we'd have to like stay on the line Three for 30 hours. more minutes before <laughs> I would before before that. Uh hmm. I mean, every uh, yeah, I have yeah. such such a large support crew, so oh, that's um, wonderful. They're all okay. great. Cool. Well, and what would be the best way for people to follow along with you in the future if they if they want to check out some more? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm active across probably the most active on Twitter, uh, and Instagram. And, uh, you can find me, it's, uh, Amelia Boone on Twitter and AR Boone 11 on Instagram, my website, which is neglected, but the blog is still updated every once in a while, mm-hmm. uh, Amelia Boone And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, that's really where you'll find me okay. always. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It was fantastic to talk to you and uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. I absolutely loved what she said about the more vulnerable you are, the more confident you become. I feel exactly the same way. And I hope you will consider being brave in the future because it really is therapeutic, especially as you never know who is sharing, who is reading your struggles and you could be helping them. And if you share your struggles, then you never know who could be reading and kind of feeling so much better because you are the one that is making them make a change. So consider it. I know it's scary, but trust me, it's worth it. So that what I just want to remind you that the marathon and half marathon training plans from my husband Steve and I are now up on my website at tinamuir.com and we have a 40 to 50 and a 60 to 70 mile per week marathon and half marathon training plans. I will give you more information and a video on that if you are confused or you're a bit intimidated and you can find that at the show notes for this episode at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 10 and I'll also put a link to Amelia's blog post that we talked about today and the documentary Rise of the Suffer Fest, which I would definitely recommend uh, watching. I really, really enjoyed watching it and I'm not even an obstacle racer. So I hope you will share this podcast with your friends, your family, you know, in your Facebook groups, wherever else, because the more I can get this podcast to grow, the more I can get, you know, really high level people on here. And it's just, you know, it just helps me to get their attention and just to really help it grow. So I really, really, really appreciate any sharing that you do. And uh, I want to thank you to anyone who has shared. It really, really means so much. So next week, we're talking to Tom Payne, who is a British runner. His number one running goal is 
eerily similar to mine and you're going to hear about that story but actually the main reason I had him on was because he lived in Kenya um, as a professional runner for a year and also was an athlete manager and is now kind of working on that on his own and you are really going to enjoy this kind of insight into life as a Kenyan runner it's so interesting and you're really going to enjoy it so I hope you have a great week and I will see you next week Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.